As Euro 2020 finally approached after last year's delay, we at Copper 90 decided we wanted to tell the story of this summer's tournament. To find that story, we looked as far as Finland, who have qualified for not only their first ever men's Euros, but first ever men's tournament. We considered the story of England, who, as host of this tournament's semi-finals and final, went on an inspiring run all the way to the final in front of their own fans. Somehow, we decided that the story of the summer was here in Scotland. A team who ended up bottom of their group with only one point. I can't, you got, uh, I'll. And one goal. I'm done, I'm done, I can't watch this But despite their very few goals, their very few points, let's be frank, their very little sunshine, even in June, we still came across a footballing story as rich, as romantic, as fascinating as any other across Europe this summer. How have you done this for the last 22 years? I don't I know. I can't answer green. <laughs>So why did we choose Scotland to cover this summer's Euros? Well, to get to that, we have to start at the beginning. Not the beginning of the Euros, not even the beginning of the Euro qualifiers, but the beginnings of the game. We invented football, it wasn't the English. Scotland invented football as we know it. So that's a rumour. No, it's the truth. We invented football. It's our game. <laughs> Scotland invented the passing game. Scotland pretty much invented the passing move. The idea of like passing to a player and running and then getting the ball back and then scoring. Because in England it used to just be kick and run, whereas in Scotland in like the 1880s and that. That idea of passing to a player and then running with it was completely un unique. And it became the style of football that was played around the world. See, when we looked into the story of Scotland, we found this country's role in the history of football is immeasurable. Scotland exported the game to the rest of the world. Scotland took that across down to South America. So if you look at the history of these South American teams. Charles Miller, a Scot a railway worker that went out to Sao Paulo, took the game out to Brazil, formed what we now know as Corinthians. And he's actually got a street named after him in Sao Paulo. Players that played here were called the Scottish professors because they were so good at the game. And then a lot of them went down to clubs in England. The first ever Invincibles. 100 years before Arsenal ever did it. Preston North End, half the team were Scottish. I mean, take a quick glance into all the very first in football and more likely than not, Scotland plays a part. Where first, we're standing where now? We're standing, first uh, grandstand, first embankment. So it's the first ever football stadium in the world, effectively. The oldest football was found in Stirling. Leather bound ball it was invented in Scotland. The first turnstiles were here. We're here. The first season book season ticket book. The first proper ground, the first dugout, the first black captain. And the first international black player to play football and he captained Scotland. Andrew Watson. The crossbar. Aye. It was invented in Scotland. Aye, it was invented what? at Queen's Park. What was it before that? They just used tape. So that kind of heritage is, yeah, is really important. Well, so you're saying Scotland even invented warming up? Aye. I mean, Aye. I mean, Aye. when the weather's cold, you kind of have to do it, but... Then there's their role in the off-pitch culture of the game from stadiums. Archibald Leach. He was a Scottish architect and building these sort of amphitheatres, yeah, cathedrals of, of, of the sport. 16 out of 22 clubs in the English First Division actually had their stadium designed by this guy. He did Old Trafford, uh, Goodison Park, Anfield, Chelsea, Fulham, Villa Park, Fratton Park as well. To the casual scene. Most cities in Scotland are yeah, really saying, involved yeah. in casual culture. It's a pretty big scene up here. Scotland has played a massive role in football fashion culture. We were one of the first people to do it. How, how were you able to do that in small towns? Good shops. <laughs> Good shops, yeah. Getting guys to come off the boat with thousands, you know, getting paid off the fishing boat and come in and buy loads of club and that. Way. There's lots of people in Scottish culture who follow football who are at the forefront of everything that's happening. And I think Hannon epitomises that. Hannon's a streetwear store based out of Aberdeen. Well, so Aberdeen are massive. Casual scene. Only a handful of places in the UK that you could get the level of products that, that Hannon sells. That stemmed from the rich culture we've got of Aberdeen going over to Europe in those early 80s days. With Alex Ferguson as manager, you know, Aberdeen were a, a huge team and a huge success in the 80s, so they were obviously travelling you know, throughout Europe and seeing what people were wearing on the terraces, you know, and then buying that product there, taking it back and you know, wearing it in Scotland. And I guess that's why you know, Hannon now you know, is why we're such a respected name in Scotland, but also, you know, globally. And then there's their unrivaled contribution to the managerial side of the game. Jock Steen, 
Bill Shankly, Bob Paisley, and of course, Sir Alex Ferguson, arguably the greatest manager in the history of the sport. If that list doesn't convince you, look up this tiny little seaside town called Largs, where the SFA do their coaching badges. It's a place where some of the world's greatest managers have come to learn their trade. They're known as the Largs Mafia. Giovanni Trapattoni, Fabio Capello, Arrigo Sacchi, Andre Villas Boas, and even Jose Mourinho, who states that it was such an important part of him learning how to become a manager. Put simply, if it wasn't for Scotland, the game as we know it wouldn't look anything like it does today on or even off the pitch. When you consider the impact of Scotland as a country on the footballing world and what we've been able to give to the world. Scotland is the football nation. And if the significant role Scotland has played in football is noteworthy, well, the incredible role football has played in Scotland is equally important. Football is very much the backbone of society in Glasgow, well, in Glasgow and Scotland. It's just, it's always there. It's, it's always, like I say, it's, it's a shadow that follows us everywhere we go. Scotland is, uh, is a football nation to its core. Pretty much everywhere you go, there will be a football pitch or somewhere that can be turned into a football pitch. Football fields or football stadiums, as I call every pitch a stadium, over the course of 25 years, I've probably shot over 500, 600 different stadiums here in Scotland. You'll find them everywhere, you know, you probably have cattle on one side and then you'll have a football pitch on the other. Unless you've got a stadium, yeah, your town's not really a town or a city. You'll find them out in the islands. FIFA had done this list of the eight most remarkable places to play football on earth. One of the eight was a pitch in Eriskay covered in sheep shit. Which is just beautiful beyond belief. It just, you know, it kind of still takes my breath away just thinking about it. On the coastline and in the inner cities. I, I love the brutalist architecture of Peter Wormsley Stadium down in Galaferradine. Halfway up mountainsides. Fort Williams, an absolutely amazing pitch. It's like right on the foothills of Ben Nevis, like literally what film the pitch and then you pan round and then there's Ben Nevis in the background, like it's unbelievable. We are talking about a nation where the game plays a role in almost every facet of society. Like, football touches, I think, almost every single person in this country, whether you like it or not. From politics. I think every country in the world will say that politics and football kind of intermingle at some point, but in Scotland we literally have laws about what songs we can and can't sing at the football ground. That our playoff to get to the Euros, obviously no one could go because of Covid, and then it was going to be on Sky Sports. A fan called Andy Redmond, and he started this petition to be like, this should, this is a national moment. This should be on national TV. And within like four or five days, it got to Parliament and Nicola Sturgeon, First Minister, was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's get it on free air. To language. And even in, in a football context, you'll hear words that you won't hear in any other sector of life. So like a stramash or a stoter, a rasper, a brammer. A rammy. Yeah, a rammy's like a fight. To the best way to gauge the pulse of a nation, pop culture, whether that's television. So New Year's Eve in Scotland is a big deal. We call it Hogmanay, but a massive part of Hogmanay, if you're Scottish, was watching a show called Only an Excuse, which was a sketch show purely about Scottish football. I liked it because I was a football fan, but like everybody watched it, like my granny, my mum. Only an Excuse was like massive, to the point where there are still phrases and catchphrases from that show that people will still recite around the countries. It highlights perfectly how like woven into the fabric football is to, to this country's culture. Like literally an entire nation is stopping before one of the most important nights of the year just to watch a piss take about football. Fashion. Football is everywhere in Scotland when it comes to fashion. People are referencing different eras within football, be it the kits, the, the, the style of the football casuals. Kids are wearing Stone Island to school. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, the only people at war Stone Island were football casuals. Music. I've worked in the music industry now for 10 years. And in Scotland, music and football goes hand in hand. It's like Rod Stewart, one of Scotland's most successful musical exports, massive football fan, to the extent where the 1986 World Cup, he let the team train at his mansion. The Proclaimers, for example, sold millions of records all over the world with 500 miles, Letter from America, songs like that. The proudest moment, I guarantee you, when Hibs won the Scottish Cup for the first time in 150 years, and Hibs fans sung this. Oh, and of course, cinema. You look at any Scottish film over the last 40, 50 years, even if it's not about football, there'll still be scenes about football in it. What are you two talking about? Football! Filth, 
Acid House, Shallow Grave, Sweet Sixteen, My Name Is Joe. I know it's just football, but it's important to us. Do you know what I mean? Rat Catcher. I like football, Dad. Can I watch it? Oh, my God. And of course, train spotting. Choose life. Because you can't tell stories about Scottish life, Scottish culture, without showing football being part of that. Turn a corner, strike up a conversation, open a newspaper, and before you know it, football, in some way, shape, or form, will make an appearance in a uniquely Scottish way. If you actually look at the very fabric of society, for good, for bad, for anything in Scotland, football is interwoven into it. It's a country where the pride of every city, town, or village is their local football club. I think there's something like 600 football clubs in Scotland. You won't know how important the club game is to people in Scotland. It is statistically, per capita, the best supported league in the world. Each and every one with more than a hundred years of history. You'll, you'll find that most clubs are formed in the 1800s. We formed in 1884. We're formed in 1877. 1893. We don't let our clubs die so easily. Formed in 1878. 1883. 1874. 1879. It was founded in 1885. Culture. First in Johnston, been in Europe seven times. The first purpose-built stadium in Britain. Motherwell FC, one of the only Scottish teams to play in all four European tournaments. We're one of the first fan-owned football clubs in the whole of the UK. Heritage at Dundee United. We're undefeated against Barcelona. We've played them four times and we've beat them four <laughs> times in Europe. The Aberdeen Football Club, four times Scottish champions, winners of the Cup Winners Cup, beating Real Madrid in the final under Sir Alex Ferguson. And fascinating characteristics. Falkirk are the only club in Scotland to have ever broken a world transfer record. St Mirren from the town of Paisley. St Mirren is like the patron saint of Paisley. Try to adopt a more ultras mentality, more choreographed displays, a lot more colour in the stand. It's not just your your typical standard cut-out football club. This club here led against a Bayern Munich. Each club's got an individual, unique character about them, um, from our bro. We're Ardwell founded in 1878, and we've got the biggest scoreline in world football, 36-0. This tattoo here is football culture in 1880s. We beat Bon Accord 36 0. To Queen's Park. The Queen's Park are one of the first football teams in Scotland and in the world. But they also played in the FA Cup in England and they got to the semi finals or even the finals at one point. Um, you'll find that in everywhere. everywhere. Hartman Lothian Football Club, the big team in Edinburgh. The Hartman Lothian badge right in the middle of the city. You see like hundreds and hundreds of people every day walking by spitting on the Hearts badge. It's supposed to be good luck spitting it. Welcome to Dumbarton Football Club, first ever winners of the Scottish Football League, joint with Rangers, but we'll keep that quiet because then they'll need to change their stars on their. Badge. These places have clubs that are so ingrained into the culture of those local communities that the community couldn't exist without them. Hibs really feels part of the Leaf community, you know, it's just the two are interchangeable. But that doesn't mean it's all positive, as naturally, with anything taken as obsessively and seriously as the Scots take football, it's important to note there can be darker sides. I realised that football brings happiness to a lot of people and it brings people together um, but it also does have its downfalls and its negative uh, connotations. Politics, the violence, the, when I was growing up it was very much like you had to watch what you were wearing in certain areas, you couldn't wear specific colours. In so many occasions I've been out on the bus and it's like what team do you support and that's very much a thing in Glasgow where what team do you support basically means <laughs> Do what I fight. <laughs> that's, that's why I take the piss out of football, do you know what I mean? Like, I, my work is tongue-in-cheek irony. I was trying to say that if you're not involved in it, in this weird middle ground, I think that's a good way of trying to describe something that's really complex. And then there's the national team, whose role in international football goes all the way back to game one. You know, the first international was played in Scotland. It's played in party cricket ground, which is just across there. From the mid to late 20th century, Scotland appeared regularly in international football. Up until France 98, Scotland had the same qualifying rate as England, 10 tournaments. Where, whenever there was a summer tournament, more likely than not, you'd see the Scots there on. Players like Dalglish, Souness, Hansen. Guys that are playing for Liverpool, guys that are winning European Cups. And especially off the pitch. You grow up hearing about these kind of halcyon days of like this, the 70s and 80s and into the 90s. Where there's become a culture around thousands of fans going to follow their team at a World Cup somewhere. Scotland were one of the first to really celebrate that in all its glory. It is like an invading army. And that led to... It's the Tartan Army. The three things that the Tartan Army represent, what they stand for, it's definitely beer. Boogie. Boogie. 
and just having a good time at every every opportunity we can possibly have, man. So the Scottish national team doesn't actually have a name. Um, it's the supporters that have a name that's known the world over, the Tartan Army. Is we're taking over a city, but it's a fun party atmosphere. It's not hostile in any way. We want to look after ourselves and we want to look after the countries that we visit. We welcome the locals to come and party with us. We buy them a beer, they buy us a beer. We, we will drink any nation under the table. That is true. That's why we have a 10 to 10 ban on alcohol. No one parties like the Scots. Argentina 78. That was mass hysteria. Even though it was under a dictatorship at the time, we took out thousands of fans to Argentina and it added just such colour and brightness to the tournament. And Scotland really started to make a name for themselves as a supporter group, as well as a country. 10,000 went to Spain in 82 when it wasn't that common. And that's a minimum. There's a small town in uh, South Ayrshire called Mabel. Like the entire town just chipped in for a double-decker bus and just drove to Spain. If you look at Italia 90. Something special about that one. I know one guy who organised 800 fans, 16 buses. The amount of fans that went over, the stories that you hear. When it came to the Sweden game, as Jockstein once said, I've never seen a fan score a goal, but the support that night helped that team get over the line. Italian 90 and I think France 98 as well. France 98 was a blast. All the fans in the stand going crazy. Just, it was bedlam. Scotland were awarded the fans of the tournament at both those tournaments. I picked up that trophy. It's normally awarded to the best player in the tournament. It's for fair play, but they awarded it to the Tartan Army. Instead of a football team or a football player. So everyone always says that the Tartan Army are who they want to see at tournaments. But then, at the turn of the century, Something in Scottish international football went seriously wrong in some of the most ridiculous, embarrassing and unfathomable ways. From France 98 onwards, essentially, it's a story of eternal disappointment. I mean, we're talking about 20 straight years of failed qualification campaigns, each and every one more heartbreaking than the next. Uh, the last 20 years has been, I think, the era of like glorious failure. Euro 2000, England in the playoff. We couldn't believe it. It was a lifetime's ambition achieved, seeing Scotland win at Wembley but it counted for nothing. Because England beat us 2-0 in the first leg. They beat us at Hamden, so we didn't qualify. 2002 was a, a horror show. Oh, fuck. You really want to go into that? You listen to this, Paul, 2002. We drew with Germany, but we also drew with the Faroe Islands. The guy scored two goals, he was a school teacher, there was a big deal about it. That the Faroe Islands striker was a school teacher? Yes. You're 2-0 down against the Faroes at half time. Or just think, just, this doesn't happen to Scotland. People are going apple-fucking-plectic. A part-time team, all their players were home-based, they were just fishermen, <laughs> school teachers, firemen. 2004. Yeah, that was fucking brutal. That playoff against the Netherlands, first leg. We win 1-0. So we went to Amsterdam thinking, just need a draw and we're going to the Euros. And then after 20 minutes, it's just a case of 1-0 down, 2-0 down, 3-0 down. So we get pumped 6-0. Nightmare. And that was just head and hands the whole time, man. It was just like, what the fuck? 2006 World Cup qualifiers were just a disaster. I don't think we won a game until halfway through qualifying and it was the nail in our coffin was losing 1-0 at home in the rain to Belarus. 2008 was the worst one, and it broke everyone's hearts. It was devastating. 2008 just made me question why I'm even a football fan in the first place. That's the time that sticks in everyone's mind the most. It's the only time I've ever actually cried at a football match. We were drawn against Italy, France and Ukraine, who were three of the best teams in the world at that point. We were brilliant in that group, beating France home and away, beat Ukraine at home, completely destroyed them at home. So we needed four points in the last two games, and in typical Scotland fashion, we went to possibly the easiest game of the lot. Obviously, we'll win against Georgia. Georgia, 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 don't. It's I feel great. like Georgia's become like a symbol of... It's the ultimate darkest moment. We played Georgia, and we were set out to beat them. So, Georgia? Who the fuck are Georgia? We'll pump them. And we lost. No, they'll pump us. Smashed by Georgia. They had a 17-year-old goalkeeper in the international. Humiliating. That burgundy kit against Georgia as well. Diodora brought out this new Diodora red kit. I bought that and I never, never wore it again. It had the potential to be one of Scotland's most iconic kits and <laughs> it's just shunned by everyone now. It meant that we had to beat Italy. The atmosphere was, it felt like the build-up to a tournament. 
just for that one game. I remember my boss just shutting the shop so we could all go to the pub and watch the game. For a qualifier? For a qualifier. Bearing in mind this was against the world champions and we had to beat them. And we were so close to doing it. We were drawing 1-1 until the final minute. I can still see it when I close my eyes. Alan Hutton. Alan Hutton gets kind of barged off the ball and for some reason it's a free kick. And to you. No, no, a free kick to Italy. That was obviously a free kick and I gave it to Italy. You're like, what's going on here? That was, that was a foul on Alan Hutton. And Italy take the free kick and... You just wait for the, the net to move and it's that heart sinking moment of... As soon as that goal goes in, I just go into a daze. It's, it's over. And I walk out the pub. It's over again. And I didn't know what else to do. I just sat down on the curb and cried. And how many times have we felt that as Scotland fans of just waiting for the net to move and for your heart to sink in a bad way? We've never had that in a good way. <laughs> Very rarely had waiting for the net to move in a good way. And while such an era of glorious failure would probably be too much for many, the Tartan army still followed in huge numbers wherever Scotland played. Fallen Scotland the qualifiers, I think there's hardly a country you have not visited. So Fallen Scotland have been to Lithuania, Czech Republic, Moldova, Slovenia, Slovakia, Georgia, Sweden, Liechtenstein. <laughs> I've only missed one home qualifier in that time and that was Faroe Islands at Celtic Park in 2006. That's because me and my wife got married that summer, so we'll... <laughs> poor timing on the yeah. honeymoon. But... Again, you've got to appreciate the Scottish love of bus travel. Find guys that will spend two days, like I'm talking about 48 hours solid in a bus, to go to a game. Like, are you off your head? You think, why, why are we doing this? Just more heartache, more, more torture, more pain. Am I going to do it again? But it's, I mean, you, you question it for a few seconds. You're always going to go back. You're joining up with the Tartan Army, you're going abroad, and life's for living. And you actually appreciate that this is opening your eyes, it's giving you experiences that you wouldn't have otherwise. The night that we beat France away in Paris, there was just, it was bonkers. 11,000 Scotland fans went to Paris for the, this one game against the French. And whilst I'm sure the fierce Scottish passion for football helped them get through the hard times, I really feel like it was another Scottish attribute that got this country through the misery. I am, of course, talking about their unique sense of humour. You go on a trip with Scotland and everyone says it's normally a great trip spoiled by 90 minutes of football. Dear, what was the lowest point? Italy. Kazakhstan! We don't laugh because we don't take it seriously, we laugh because we have to laugh to get through it. The humour is really important. Humour plays a massive role in Scottish football because without it, we'd be depressed all the time. <laughs> <laughs> There's no patter, there's no humour like the Scottish, it's quite, it's quite particular if you've seen anything online. Nah, Scottish Twitter's brilliant. Scottish Twitter in general is kind of like a portal online where just some of the funniest, most self-deprecating, dry humour becomes apparent. Sometimes it's kind of like the best part of being Scottish. We laugh at ourselves, we are the butt of all our jokes. Scotland are very self-deprecating. Oh, that's an example, like train spotting. Oh, it's shite being Scottish. With the lowest of the low. <laughs> it's shite being Scottish, I think, since then. It's, that's that fueled a thing. Genuinely reckon if we won the Euros that, that we would still cling on to that mentality just shite being Scottish. Yeah. Yeah, it just is it. We're, we're proud of it, I would say. That line in the film, you know, you know what he's saying? No one does dislikes being Scottish. But it is shite. But if anyone laughs at us, then it gets our backs up. And we're like, who the fuck are you? It's like, it is shite to be Scottish, but we get to decide that it's shite. We don't let other people tell us that it's shite. And boy, they'd need that sense of humour, because in 2008, Things got even worse. 2010, the whole thing was just a shit show on and off the park. That's when I think for me it started to get the worst point. Boozegate. Oh, God. Boozegate. Boozegate was just... A sense of anger everywhere and everyone was just like, this is shit. Like, this is really, really shit. The number of players that had stayed up past curfew in the team hotel drinking, they were benched for the next game and they were photographed, you know, like, giving the fingers to the Scottish press. And in the home game against Norway, we had the worst miss of all time. Chris Iwilumu's miss was so bad that half the Scottish commentators thought it had gone into the net and were commentating as if we'd gone one nil up. The boy from Cork Bridge has put Scotland in front. You can watch that clip a hundred times, a thousand times, and you can still not know how he didn't score that goal. Oh my God! I don't believe it! You missed that! <laughs> 
Euro 2012 qualifiers were another disaster. I think our only two wins were against Lithuania and a 97th minute winner against Liechtenstein at home. Is that how low we've come? That we're struggling to beat Liechtenstein at home? 2014, that was just full of disappointments. Didn't win a home match until the very final game of the campaign. Euro 2016 really hurt. We lost to Georgia again. I, honestly, I hope we never have to play Georgia again. Oh, fucking hell. Uh, what was it? Ray Charles, George on my mind. Uh, right. Right, a permanent fucking nightmare. It went down to pretty much the final group game. What we needed was to beat Poland and for Ireland to lose to Germany. Germany were all champions at the time. Like We were like, yeah, they're going to beat Ireland, don't worry about it. <laughs> Ireland beat Germany. What, what could you think? Like, you're just bemused. Uh... And we conceded a 90th minute equaliser. That was the moment I had the epiphany, we're probably never going to qualify ever again. That's, that's the closest I've come to crying since the last time. Well, for me as a Scotland fan, that was the hardest moment because you had England, you had Wales, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland. All the other home nations qualified and we didn't. Wall to wall TV, the whole, we're the only ones not there. I think to me that was the sick of them. We were kind of like Dickensian orphans peering in through the bakery window to something we couldn't touch. We came up here where we were just like soul searching, like navel gazing, and like, why is it? Why are Wales in the semi final? Like, what are Wales doing? They played rugby, did they not? But for Wales to get to the semi finals of the European Championships, somebody's having a laugh somewhere. Come on. Did it hurt though? Very much. Fuck, man, yeah. Uh, um, World Cup 2018. That 2018 qualifying campaign ended with a draw in Slovenia. We only needed a win that day. I was there and I remember just at full time slumping into my seat and crying. It, it hit home because it had been two full decades since that World Cup 98 and it just felt like it was never coming back for us. Every time we're in a qualifying round, every time, every year you just go for fuck's sake, not again. I think it's a collective 20 odd years of always messing it up has created this feeling of... For fuck's sake, and you're just sick of saying, oh, for fuck's sake, and it gets to that stage where, you know, you're saying, oh, for fuck's sake, without even thinking, oh, for fuck's sake. It's, that's how I... You, you, you can't take that amount of heartache and sadness. All these excuses we make for not being there, they can't, they can't be the, the answer. And it's like, well, how, did that, how is Andy Murray one of the best tennis players in the world? Why is our women's team brilliant? But it wasn't all misery, as in 2019, the Scottish women's team gave this country the summer tournament they'd been waiting for. It was amazing to see the women's team qualify for France because we finally got that flavour of what it's like to be part of the party again. Unfortunately, they provided the same chaotic scenes on the pitch as the men's team. We were 3-0 up against Argentina and contrived to draw the game 3 all, including, I think, conceding two penalties and not getting out of the group. And so as Euro 2020 approached and Scotland was announced as one of the hosts of the tournament, it felt like it was now or never. So for us to be hosting and not to be there would have just been the ultimate slap in the face. So there's a party in the kitchen and you're locked out of the kitchen. It wasn't orthodox. Made the playoff final through the Nations League. Away in Belgrade to Serbia. As a backup because we didn't qualify through the traditional qualifiers. It wasn't pretty. We take the lead through Ryan Christie. And then, in typical Scotland fashion, we concede in the 94th minute. It wasn't easy. We get to penalties, but they did it. That penalty save was like nothing I've ever experienced in my life. It was such a great feeling. You've actually got to be Scottish to understand what that save meant. A moment of like national catharsis. Well, I think I've cried like five times just thinking about it. Ryan Christie broke down on TV. Sir Alex admitted he broke down watching the TV. Those reactions aren't just generated for the camera. They come from the heart, they come from the soul. Ryan Christie to Sir Alex Ferguson to us two is crying. It's just the whole nation linked in arms. And every Scot from Dundee to Inverness took to the cold November streets to celebrate because for the first time this century, the Scottish men's team were going to a summer tournament. Because it was in lockdown, the pubs had actually closed. So you have videos of fans on the roofs of flats, playing bagpipes. Well, we figured whatever it does look like, we want in. From the bars to the streets, from the stands to the squares, for a moment in Scottish history, 23 years in the making. And so we're going on a road trip.
to try and touch every corner of this country and get an understanding of how a country with such a rich footballing heritage has taken so long to play in a tournament. And now that they're finally here, what's it look like and what does it mean? Teams that qualify regularly probably don't think about it. There's so much to this that's exciting that I don't think a lot of people realise. It's not just the games, it's everything. It's, it's, the, it's the national mood, it's seeing your team in the Panini sticker album. Waiting for your own players to come up out of the packet. Me and my flatmate putting up flags all around our living room and out the window and stuff like that. It seemed like the squad lineup video coming out as well. Cable tying Scotland flags up at like half three in the morning in my street. When I've seen the euphoria that's come round now, it's just, I think it's just totally off the scale. And if I hear, I, yes sir, I can boogie one more time, I'm going to absolutely scream my lungs out. That, that song, uh, yeah, this song started in Aberdeen because of Andy Considine. It actually isn't in the squad for the tournament, but was in the squad at the time when we played Serbia in the playoff. A long time ago, many years ago, there was a video that came out from when he was on his stag do, and he was dressed up as a woman. He was dancing to Yes Sir, I Can Boogie. Yes, sir, I can boogie. So then when we qualified, Considine was in the squad at the time, and the footage from the dressing room when the players went back in was they all started getting up singing. Yes, sir, I can boogie. Everyone in the nation just adopted it and everyone was singing it and it just became this. It's this kind of weird anthem because... Oh, every day, all the time, everyone's singing it. It's stuck in everyone's head. So everyone's got on Facebook the kind of picture profiles and now Yes Sir I Can Boogie. And... I mean, that's a song by a Spanish artist who an Aberdeen player got dressed up as a woman on a stag do and is now almost a national anthem. I think... That's international football. That that's it, I The whole like, month has just been incredibly special. We've never witnessed anything like this. So you go to anywhere in the country, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Dundee, Montrose, our broth. See how much it means, the pride, we finally made it to the party. The, the mood's been like unbelievable. Like, everyone's just pure buzzing about Scotland again. Can I please get a Is pint it? of... Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's time for one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let me get a pint of it. Yeah. If we get through the group, into the knockout stages, this country will go daft. It'll go oh, daft. See, 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 Scotland's the story of this tournament because there will be scenes that you won't see in any other country. And you always just wish every summer to watch Scotland in the tournament, you know, with my kids. Are you going to watch the game? No, um, my teacher's watching it. Your teacher's what? Have you not heard about this girl, Poppy? Girl in Clydebank has written a letter to the Prime Minister and her headmaster demanding that she gets to watch the game on Monday. <laughs> and not only has the, the headmaster written a letter back saying, OK, I'll give you what you want, John McGinn. Just a, a big congratulations to Poppy, so if everyone can give Poppy a wee high five or, or a round of applause. How hard has it been being a Scotland fan for the last 20 years? Pretty tortured. That's why I prefer St Johnston, because um, Scotland never get into major things. <laughs> making the Euros at home. It's everything that I've missed in my lifetime. It's amazing just seeing everyone sort of come together as one. Here to look for the first ever stadium, effectively, from this ground where modern football was invented here. And then for the finals we played literally just over there, the current Hamden is just brilliant. It's kind of like full circle, isn't it? Absolutely. We've got to get a result in the first game. If we don't get the result in the first one, then it's just going to be another oh, for fuck's sake moment. But for the first time, in a long, long time, there's an actual belief. What's the date? June 14, 2021. The last time this country woke up to being in such a tournament was back on June 23, 1998. We're talking about a whole generation uh, ago, maybe even two and you can just see what it means. Even the, the First Minister has woken up first thing in the morning and tweeted, believe it or not, a link to Yes Sir I Can Boogie. It really feels like this country is about to go through one big boogie. For us, we're heading to Glasgow for two quick interviews before the game, for, for, for two similar people with two very different situations. First, I want to catch up with a guy called Clark. Clark has been to every single qualifier over, I think, the last few decades. And finally today, the match he goes to is an actual tournament proper. Last night it's sunken. Last time I did this was when we played Brazil in the Stade de France, and 23 years later, I'm going to see It's a century. The other fan is a guy called Craig. Now, Craig is a, another huge Scotland fan. He's gone to heaps of qualifiers, but unlike Clark, 
He hasn't managed to get a ticket. For the last two years, I've been doing favours on the off chance if Scotland get to the Euros, I'll be there. But it's no chance. They're gold dust. You remember, this is the hottest ticket in the country. It has been since they qualified back in November. Surely you got one. No one got one. But here's the catch. We've actually got a spare ticket and we want to give it to him. But still, <laughs> the grass isn't always greener. But sometimes it is because we got you a ticket. No fucking way. Come on, man. <laughs> no way. You're going, man. No chance. You're going. Are you serious? You think we're going to let you miss out after oh, years of trying? Man. From there, we're going to send him into the stadium, soak up the match day atmosphere. <laughs> and then we're heading to Dundee. In the meantime, go to the best option you can do when you're in the car. The classic BBC radio, BBC Scotland radio this time, to build that euphoria and just get us into the mood. It has been 8,392 days since Scotland last kicked a ball in anger at a major finals in international football for the men's team. And I honestly think that Scotland have got like a wee chance of doing something. First game, yeah. what do you have to do? We'll win that, 2-1. You're gonna win? Yeah. I want to see us really target the Czech Republic in that first game. What's the point of going into a game if you're going to only settle for one point? They're a side that we've got a good record against. Uh, I think we can definitely beat them. Well, tactical group stages, yeah, but oh, I want to see us go for a win, you know? It, like, it gives you well, something. Well, happen, as everybody will be really excited. I'm all good, babe. You've got to think positive. Ah, oh, come on, you got to have faith, no? No, you're saying no. Well, that can't, can't go with two shite teams in my life. I'm a shite team here. And I've got Scotland to a complete shite. Oh, f***s That's too much to bear. That's what I'm never going to go insane. Go along for that. Are you kidding me? No, 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 kidding me. And Cheddar probably will be us. Trying to be positive with the score. That was a fucker bag you brought in. That was a 40 yard goal. He almost shot from his own half. Oh, f this. I don't know, uh, we always sort of shoot ourselves in the foot, too. You've had so many chances, and their first chance of this half has been from 40 yards. 45 yards. Now, I actually hate football. I, I don't know why, like, this game is so dumb. Oh, man, now I know why you don't bother. This is miserable. I'm going to Finland, I'll tell them so. I can't, you had, uh, I'll. This is normal. This is normal? A goal like that is not normal. Maybe against Scotland. Oh, you're, uh, uh, I'm lost for words. Right, it's the morning after the day before and I still can't get my head around it. 54 yards, 54 yards out. That Patrick Schick goal in 60 years of this tournament, the Euros, no one has ever scored from so far out. And Patrick Schick did it in Scotland's first Euros in more than two decades. Everyone said, expect the unexpected. Only the most absurd happens with Scotland, but I'm sorry, that was too far. I mean, Scotland were the better team. They played attacking football. I don't know how everyone's dealt with this for 20 years. I, I couldn't last, what, I think it was an hour when I walked out. I'm done, I'm done, I can't watch this shit. Having watched that match, I think I've got more questions than answers. So, we've got a few days before the next match. I've decided, let's head back out around the country and start asking what happens now. So we're hitting the road again, from Perth to Glasgow and everywhere in between, and we're just gonna try and get an understanding of where do we go from here? I'm kind of fed up with saying typical Scotland, but we had loads of possession, we had loads of chances, yeah. and you know if that if Robertson scores that goal in the first half, and if the ball doesn't hit the bar, 
I mean, it's all lifts and buts, but well, we've, we had the third most uh, shots on goal in the Euros after the first round of fixtures. We played attacking football, we, we went for it. A, a wonder goal beat us and some really good goalkeeping. I Someone, didn't think it was that bad. We had the chances against Czech Republic on that day that just didn't go our way. It is what it is. We accept it, we move on. You've had a goal line clearance in the crossbar, you've done everything but put it past the line. But so that happens, but... Uh, you, Does it? What, yeah. You're playing too well, you're putting a block I thought the Scottish imagery was it. Yeah. I thought you were meant to have lost faith in the national team. And I think maybe we're protecting ourselves a little bit, yeah. because it's like... You know, Is that that sense of humour though? Because most of those memes I saw, that were coming out right after David Marshall let that goal in, they were being made by Scottish Twitter accounts. What's yeah. that about? The memes, we create the humour. You waited 23 years to be the, arguably the meme of the, the meme team of the tournament so far. So, if you're poking fun at yourself, it means it's, le it's less tough to take when someone else is doing it. Have you seen the Spider-Man one? I like the one where Marshall got back and saved it, but using the pose that he was in, and he overhead kicked it back out the stadium. The Cantona one. Yeah, the yeah. The Australian cricket team one. Yes, yeah, we're celebrating with the cricket. I'm sure on Facebook I seen there was an album of 26 different memes. <laughs> I was going through them laughing, but it's you just... Not, you ah, you've got, you've nah, got see, to... If that was Australia, I can't laugh. I can't laugh no. at least until the next game. No, England at Wembley is the next game. I mean, that's, that's unreal. England at Wembley, we're back, man. Never fling in the towel. Game two against England, I mean, that just takes care of itself. The fact that we've got, we've not just qualified for a tournament, we've got a derby game against our oldest enemies, the old enemy. A-U-L-D. Old, old enemy. It's spelled A-U-L-D? A-U-S, Scots, old Scots. What's old Scots? Old Scots is old Scottish slang because we, we spoke differently. So you used to have your own language? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We still have our own language. Still, still, still have it, just no one can speak it. it like what it. is it about the rivalry for you that makes it such a big game? I mean, that you, that you need to talk about it for hours, I suppose, but... It seems way back in tradition. I could bore you for an hour with it. International football was created by Scotland playing England. I've got a question for you. When was the earliest derby played that you've covered? On Derby days, I guess. The Derby in Seville was the early 1900s. All right, Scotland, England, 1872. Jeez. I don't think anyone wants it to come into football, but we can't escape the, the, the age-old battles between Scotland and England, the, the Battle of Bannockburn and William Wallace and all that. You want to go back right to Hadrian's Wall, you've got it. You could say from the Highland Clearances, that's, well, there's only one way to call it. It was a genocide to the recent English media. So we, we get most of our national football coverage, I would say, through an English lens. So you watch you watch Italy versus uh, Turkey, and at half-time they're talking about the England game. You've got Gary Lineker, you've got all sorts talking about how England are going to win it and how brilliant England are, and we're kind of like, who says you're going to win it? Talk sport at the radio, all you hear about is how well England are going to do. Jamie O'Hara fucking giving it that. Like, it's like, Jesus, man, like, settle down. You aren't that great. It's an arrogance that we get from the media, and that adds to our disdain. What is it about England? Because England don't feel like... England... Oh, they're Arsenal. It's oh, Arsenal. Oh. It's, <laughs> what do so it's not the people. So all the media so English. from the media. Come on, yeah. come on. Does, does Scotland have the same arrogance, or is it oh, you just... No, no, no. We are the same. We know we're shite. Scotland, we know we're shite. England, they go to tournaments, they don't do very well either, but England keep thinking we're going to win it. We don't want to hear it, and we're bored by it. If Scotland win tomorrow, mayhem. Going, right? Yeah, I'm going, yeah. yeah. Well, we'll see. What do you mean, we'll see? You don't have a ticket right I don't. I don't have a ticket. You know, and there's only going to be 20,000 Scotland fans, possibly. Only 20,000? If it was normal times, 100 plus thousand easily. I think the bus that we've got, 35 people on it, zero tickets between us. No, you, you, yeah. you're lying. <laughs> I, I'd be there. This wouldn't be here just now. Everyone would be there. The street, like, Scotland would be empty. It's like 25,000 Scots going down and only 4,000 tickets available for Scots, so... Yeah, how many security guards have they got at Wembley? <laughs> Obviously, the film was about our experience in Scotland during the Euros, but for this match, well, we had to return to London. And it's not just the fact that this is such a historically big, iconic fixture. It's because whenever it goes down in Wembley, well, something crazy always happens. We're talking from the very beginnings of international football to the 1920s, the Wembley Wizards. But Scotland beat England 5-1 at Wembley. 67. It was one year after England were world champions and Scotland beat them in their own backyard 3-2. Became unofficial world champion. 77. 77 especially. 77. 
Yeah, that we invaded the pitch. That's the one. We went there, we beat them, we invaded the pitch, we broke the goalpost, it's in mythology. And when I speak to older Scotland fans who went to that game, they all say the same, where are you on the pitch? And a lot of them do say, yeah, I was on the pitch. Where Rod we... Stewart was on the pitch. Rod Stewart, yeah. That famous Euro 96 group stage match with the Gaza goal. The Scotland fans were doing a convo all around the terrace and going around right up the park. And Glasgow and scored. It was like, you bastard. <laughs> but now, Scotland are back at Wembley against England. We've come down on the Friday morning, the morning of the match. We actually sent our camera operator, Max, down early. He's gone down with the St. Johnson fans, and the things he sent us are just incredible. But that was last night, and the real stuff begins today. Match day. And whilst the weather hasn't turned up, I mean, I thought Scotland was having a bad summer. The scenes, the euphoria of such an iconic fixture in such a special tournament, that is a short. Into Leicester Square, I can tell you the energy is it's surreal. You, you, you forget that there was a lockdown. These guys are everywhere. The noise, uh, genuinely, it's like London is a beating heart, and all you hear over and over are songs about John McGinn. It's been in the middle yet? Is that what's in the middle? Fuck, you need to get in the middle. What's in there? Beautiful things. Let's go. There's nobody in this tournament that will appreciate being part of it as much as Scotland and the Tartan Army. In sheer passion, in sheer delight, in the numbers that we will take, in the songs that we'll sing, in the atmosphere that we'll bring. Everyone always says that the Tartan Army are who they want to see at tournaments. Yeah, we've been missed, like 100%. London. Oh, it'll be madness, it'll be mental. Scottish fans, they bring a joy. They bring atmosphere, they bring a sense of humour. They bring something that I don't think any other set of fans can bring. It, this is insane. I don't know where to look. That way you got fountains, people kicking balls, kissing, dancing. That way they're boogieing. It's, uh, it's a crossroads. Let's go boogieing. That guy's face, the, the happiness in people's faces. This is the biggest picture. For Scotland, there's no bigger. If you asked 10 Scots, who's the team you most want to beat in the world? We won't say Brazil, we won't say Argentina, we'll say England. Every single one of them will say England. Because England is the team 
no matter what else we do, if we can beat England, if we can get a result against England, that will mean more than anything else. If we win at Wembley, I don't even know what's going to happen in Scotland. I don't care if we get beat the Czech Republic. I don't get, care if we get beat with Croatia, as long as we don't get beat with England. <laughs> I think even if we got a draw at Wembley, it would be really important for us because it's credible that way. I think English fans see the Scotland national team just as a complete joke. So for us to get any form of result at Wembley, will be like, you underestimated us and you've paid for it. But even then, with the ingrained Scottish culture of we can't actually ever do it, I still wouldn't hold out hope until the referee blows for full time. The amount of last minute heartbreaks we've had as Scotland fans over the years is just innumerable. It always happens. We've got a real penchant for conceding last minute goals. No way. Spreading it to James. Bodies in the box. Oh, 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 There's a huge bundle. Am I confident of getting a result against England? No. <laughs> I think we could get, if we get a draw, a draw and then beat Croatia. So we're still there. We're having a good time. Two out of three match days done for Scotland now, and this team leaves us with more questions than answers once again. Is this country the story of the summer or the meme of the summer? Are they going to score a goal? It's been three hours now. Or even Turkey, arguably the worst team in the tournament, they've conceded nine. They've given their fans one goal to celebrate. At this point, the last game, Croatia is a must win. So, we're hitting the road again. Going back to the fans and asking them just what is going on and are they getting out of the group? What's it going to be like on, on match day on Tuesday? Oh. I'm watching it in the house, I'm not drinking a cup of tea. I'm <laughs> I'm rough still, mate. I'm Mr. Square. Aye. Yeah. Never been so buzzing about a nil-nil draw. <laughs> to have more shots than them, to have arguably outplayed them, Harry Kane couldn't get past Grant Hanway. Against Croatia, you know what, I think something will just happen. I just got a feeling that Scotland will go through. There's just something special about this kind of set up a team. Not having Bill, Billy Gilmore there, just hearing that he's been ruled out through through COVID is an absolute kick in the nuts. But the spirit around Scotland's changed massively. But if we win this game, I think it will it will be one of the one of the greatest achievements that, that the country's ever had. Well, here we go, our day of destiny. It's match day three and we said it couldn't get bigger than Scotland England, turns out it can. This last group stage match for Scotland against Croatia is a must win. Why? Because if they win, they're going out of the group and into the knockout stages for the first time in their history. 10 tournaments you've made. Never get out of the group stage. Remember, this is Scotland. It's always a really stupid moment against a team you should have beaten. Each time getting knocked out in more farcical ways. Most famously, there's Argentina 78. 78, the draw with Iran. Spain 82. 82, we missed out on goal difference because we let New Zealand score two goals against us. Italy 1990 was just as ridiculous. 1990, disaster against Costa Rica. 1998, well, we get pumped by Morocco. And then there was Euro 96. An unbelievable way for Scotland to miss out. We had to beat Switzerland and England had to beat the Netherlands by four goals. We were winning 1-0 through Ali McCoy. News starts filtering through from Wembley. It's 1-0 England, 2-0 England, 3-0 England. Then the magic one comes through, 4-0 England. You're thinking, after all those years of torture, we're finally going to do it. And then the sucker punch, the news comes through. That the Dutch oh, score. No, the Dutch have scored one. one goal. And whilst the last two match days have seen us running around desperate to get a table across Scotland or London. This time, we're running the party. We've booked out a venue in Glasgow's East End. It's a little gallery, and we've invited some of the fans we've met along the way during our incredible time here in Scotland.
What's different about Tuesday? Who's gonna score a goal for you? It's been three hours now. Shea Adams plays for Southampton. You've got John McGinn in there. You've got... Who's gonna do it? They've been playing the last two games, they haven't done it. Seriously, how did that not go in? How did that not go in? I just think something will happen. Whether it's a, a dodgy on goal or something like that, I think something will go away. Bro, I'll take it. I'll take an own goal with us, bit. Something will come up. for a country with such a rich history in the game. I just think it's so important for us as a nation to be part of the joy that comes with these events. It doesn't happen very often now, does it? What happens if Scotland get out of the group? We we'll actually go back in evolution. We've become cavemen due to alcohol consumption. So I don't know what would happen then. That's nuclear shit, man. It's really hard to put into words what Scotland qualifying for Euro 2020 means. Is there are kids that will be 22, 23 years old that will have never seen the men's team at an international tournament. What, what, what do you kind of speculate would happen if you guys go on a run? Three weeks, three weeks burned them. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Be blue snow. What's blue, blue snow? snow. Yeah. Oh, that'll be white. That'll oh, happen blue. if we get out of the group. <laughs> <laughs> it's never going to happen. <laughs> that line in the film. It's shite being Scottish! With the law, it's to the law! You, you, know, you know what he's saying? It's not... I don't he's saying no one, no one does, dislikes being Scottish. But it is shite. We do accept that we're on the, the margins of everything. Like, we're just outside of where the weather's going to be nice. We're just on the outside of where the wealth is held in the UK. We're just outside of like international competitions all the time. Do you know what I mean? Like, it is everything about being Scotland. It's just being on the cusp of kind of like, or, or, or looking in at seeing what else is happening, looking in at the, at the supposed good times. But it also means that. And congratulations. We're just going to enjoy what happens regardless. Scotland till I die. I'm Scotland till I die. I the thing is, win, lose, or draw, I'm it's Scotland almost kind of irrelevant. We want to see our team do well, but we can still find the romance and defeat. I know I am. I'm sure I am. I'm Scotland till I die. It's just being part of that narrative, being part of the story, and being allowed to make our imprint on the tournament or the spectacle of it. What I want from this is I want future generations to remember this as a tournament that's reawakening its love affair with the national team. We are literally watching Scotland in the Euros right now. I don't care what the score is like. This is nuts. This is amazing. And we are fucking shy! We are fucking shy! We are fucking shy! I don't even care what happened. We got here. Yeah. We made the most of it. We boogied. We boogied. We scored a goal. We scored a goal. We scored an amazing goal. He tried. And we had the best time ever. And we'll do it again in 2022 in Qatar. I'm Scotland till I die! I'm Scotland till I die! I know I am a Jedi! I'm a Scotland till I die! So is it still shy beating Scottish then? No, it's fucking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking amazing. <laughs>